want to welcome you to the lake. If you're new with us, I think Matt told you, if you're new, you fill out a connection card that you received on the way in, you can stop by the Resource Center. And we have a gift to say thank you for spending your morning with us. We're in this series, as you saw in the video, Who's Your One? And I, I'm encouraged because I know some of you are starting to invite people. You're bringing people with, or you're dragging people. I don't care. You're getting them here, and uh, you're, 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 you're reaching that one. And, you know, that's, that's our whole thing. The whole, this whole thing about this reaching your one, it's, it, it's, it's our challenge. I mean, it's been an inter- inter- interesting journey so far. The past four weeks, it's been kind of interesting. We've been learning a lot about how God has chosen us. God has called us as his disciples, as Jesus' disciples, to go and reach our one by, by going and inviting them to come and see. Come and see what Jesus has done in my life. Investing some time in them, getting to know them, developing a relationship with them, and then introducing them to God's love for them through Jesus' death and resurrection by telling them our story. By telling our story our way, by sharing the gospel of how Jesus has made a difference. And I I know we've learned a lot, and we've been encouraged along the way for these four weeks, but I still feel like there's a little bit, there's a a sense of hesitation. There's this this little leeriness, I I really don't know if I can do this. I really don't know if I'm the one that, if, if I'm the one that can reach that one that God has placed on my heart, that I'm the one that God could use to reach this person. Because I'm not, as, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a preacher anywhere. I'm not, I'm not popular. People really don't know that much about me, and I don't, I don't really think I qualify. I really don't think I qualify as one of Jesus' disciples. I, just, I go to church, I attend church, but I just never have seen myself as a disciple. We do know that there were 12 disciples that Jesus had. And when, if we would take a little poll, give you a pen and paper and let you write down and tell, you know, write down all 12, many of us wouldn't get all 12 because there's some that come to mind right away. There's Peter, James, and John, those three that were the closest to Jesus. Peter being the one, the disciple always opened his mouth and inserted his foot. Uh, James and John, they were the sons of thunder. And then, and then there was Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector. And then there was Doubting Thomas who wouldn't believe that Jesus rose from the dead unless he stuck his hands in his nail prints and in his side. And then there's Judas Iscariot, the betrayer. Those those top six right there usually come to our mind really quick, but there were six more. Some of them we could probably beat our brains a little bit and discuss with people and get those other ones without looking it up. So what I want to do today is I want to share with you one of these sort of insignificant, insignificant disciples that didn't rise to the top when we think about them. His name is Andrew, and I'm a, I want to share with him, but there's, there's not a whole lot recorded about Andrew. I mean, I could, I could talk all day about Peter and James and John and, and Thomas and, and Matthew and Judas, but there's not that much about Andrew in any commentaries or any biblical records. So he could be considered an insignificant disciple, one that's not really thought of very much. Uh, But there's a lot we can learn from Andrew, I think, because of his insignificance, especially if we don't see ourselves as a significant part or a significant role in what God is wanting to do by sharing the gospel, that we're not that big a deal, that we're not that important. One thing we know about Andrew is that he reached his one. He had one person in mind, and he reached his one, and his one reached thousands, reached thousands. I mean, let me tell you a little bit more about Andrew. His name, Andrew, means manly, means bold, decisive, and determined. But Andrew was not always bold. Andrew pretty much tended to stay in the background. He didn't need to be front and center. He didn't need any attention. He just sort of worked in the background and quietly went along and doing what he would do. When you open the book of John and you read about these disciples, When you read about Andrew, yes, he is a disciple of Jesus, but he was a disciple. He was a follower of John the Baptist first before Jesus came on the scene. He was one of John's disciples. And so when you think, when you read about this, that he was one of John's disciples, it seems, well, okay, Andrew had to have been baptized by John. In the Jordan River, that's what John was doing, was baptizing people. So Andrew would have been baptized by John the Baptist. And being a follower, being a disciple of John the Baptist, he was always with him. So we heard on occasion, more than once, how even when, even when John was questioned by the Pharisees, that I baptize you with water, but there is one who's coming. 
that he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Understand this. I'm just a forerunner. I'm just preparing the way. I'm not the, the one, but the one who's coming, he will take away your sins. And if John, I mean, if Andrew is a disciple of John the Baptist, and he's probably there when John says, hey, and calls out Jesus from in the crowd and says in John chapter 1, verse 29, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's right there. And, and Andrew sees him. And then we read about how John baptizes Jesus. And the next day, when you go in John chapter 1 down to verse 35, the very next day, the next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Hey, he's the one I told you about yesterday. Remember, he's the one that I baptized yesterday. And the Spirit of God came and rested on him. He's the one. In case you didn't, he might be wearing something different today, but that's the one I told you about. And then it says in verse 37, the two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. These two disciples left John the Baptist and began following Jesus. But how do we know that one of them was Andrew? I mean, how many disciples did John have? I mean, how do we know that this one of the two is Andrew? All you got to do is read just a little bit further. In verse 40, one of the two who heard John speak, who heard John say, Behold, this is the Lamb of God, and followed Jesus was Andrew. So we know it's Andrew. Andrew was a disciple, follower of John the Baptist. Now he's following Jesus. And his name was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now, why would, why would John put that in there, that Andrew is Simon Peter's brother? Because at the time this was written, after Jesus' resurrection and ascension, people know who Peter is. They don't know who Andrew is. Andrew's not as popular as Peter. So, hey, this, you know, that, you're like, oh, you're so-and-so's brother. Oh, are you related to, you know, somebody that they know that we're the insignificant ones. Well, Andrew is insignificant compared to Simon Peter, but he says that this is Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, the first thing that Andrew does, the very first thing that Andrew does as a follower of Jesus, he goes to find his brother and says, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. See, Andrew didn't tell Simon who Jesus was. He didn't tell Simon where he could go find Jesus. He didn't tell Simon which church he could go to to hear about Jesus. He didn't take Simon and just drop him off at a church somewhere. He brought Simon to Jesus. He personally brought him to Jesus. So why, why do you think that John, why do you think the writer of this gospel in this part of the scripture emphasizes the first thing Andrew did? Why did he put so much emphasis on the first thing he did? was go and find his brother and bring him to Jesus. I'll tell you why. It's to connect us to Andrew. I know it's hard for us in our minds to even think we could, we could, uh, could even be a disciple of Jesus. It's unattainable in our minds. We just have all these excuses that we can never be a disciple, but we're a lot more like the disciples than we realize, especially Andrew. Because when we look at the life of Andrew, just in this one passage, when we look at the life of Andrew, we see that he's an inviter. And look, he hasn't been with Jesus very long, and the first thing he does, he goes and finds his brother and says, come and see. I want to invite you to come and see the Messiah. I want to I invite you to come and see Jesus and what I've learned in just a little bit of time. I want you to come and see. I've told you this a couple of weeks ago, that 96% of the people that we invite to come and see, will come. They'll come. And you know what they're going to see? They're going to see other believers gathered in a room together, worshiping God for who He is and what He's done in their life. They're going to come and see that. They're going to come and hear the gospel, that God sent His Son to die for them, to give His life for them, to save their lives. And if they believe that and accept that, they would have a relationship with God in eternity. They're, they're going to hear that. People will come and see when they're invited by a friend or a co-worker or a neighbor, even a family member, they'll come and see. And that's what Andrew did. He invited his brother. So understand, we invite people, we also invest in them. Well, Andrew had an investment in Peter. They're brothers. They, they know each other really well. So well that Simon, I mean, Andrew knew that his brother needed to meet this rabbi. 
Isn't that something? You know somebody so well, you know that they have to meet this rabbi. They're headed in a direction. They've been turned away by rabbis in the past, but you've got to come meet this one. You've got to come see this one. So there, there's an investment there that's been made. And he not only invites Simon to come and see Jesus, to meet this rabbi, but he introduces Simon to Jesus. He introduces, he brings him and says, hey, this is Jesus. He made it personal, probably telling him what Jesus has done in his short time together with Andrew. Like Andrew, we invite someone. We invite them to come and see. We invest in them. We introduce them to Jesus through our story. The way we understand the gospel and what Jesus has done in our life, how he has changed our life and made a difference in our life. I mean, every, everyone has a story. Everyone has a story, especially believers. We have that story of our life before Jesus, and then we have a story of our life after we meet Jesus. It's the power of the gospel that changes people's lives. And all we got to do is invite them and introduce them. Have you, have, you never, have you never introduced anybody to someone? Have you never taken the time to say, Oh, hi, um, my name's Ronnie, this is my wife, Karen. Hi, hi I, I'm Ronnie, this is, this is my best friend, Matt, Eric. Hi, let me introduce you to the one who saved my life and changed me forever. Have you never done that? Because when something incredible happens in our life and something amazing happens in our life, something just astounding, life-changing happens to us, we want to introduce somebody to whatever it was or whoever it was. That's just who we are. We want to introduce somebody to something that's really good that's happened in our life. Why? Why do we do that? Why do we invite people to come and see? Why do we invest any time in them? Why do we introduce them to Jesus? Because as a child of God... We care about them and their eternity. That's why we do this. That's why we reach our one. When we look at the life of Andrew, we see that he saw the value. He saw the value of individual people. He saw the value of an individual person. He saw the value in, in leading Peter to Jesus. Andrew saw the value of an individual person. Almost every time Andrew is mentioned in the gospel, which is not a whole lot, but every time he's mentioned in the gospel, he's bringing someone to Jesus. It's every time. Here, Andrew's bringing, he brought some Greeks that wanted to see Jesus because Philip didn't know how to do it. So Andrew says, I'll bring you. I'll show you. This is what I do. I, I just invite people. That's who I am. He was driven by a passion to do whatever he could to help someone's life be changed. And after just a short time with Jesus, he brought his brother to him. I mean, how significant was that? Just that one thing, that one person. I mean, let me show you how significant that one person was. If Andrew had not invited Peter to meet Jesus, think about this. If he had not invited Peter, then Peter would have never spoke on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 people would have repented and been baptized. Andrew saw the significance, the value of one individual person. And we've talked about this before, how we can look and see all these famous evangelists and all these famous preachers. And when you really research their lives and go back in time of where they start, they were always introduced to Jesus by one person. One person introduced Dwight L. Moody to Jesus. One person introduced Charles Spurgeon to Jesus. One person... That's all it comes down to. And when we look at our lives, when we look at back at our journey as a follower of Jesus, back to the very start, it probably wasn't a lot of people, but it was probably, we could probably pick out that one person that introduced us, that saw value in us and invited us, in, 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 invested in us, and introduced us to God's love for us through an individual, personal conversation. I know I can. I know I, I, I walked the aisle at a revival, a church filled with people, but it was because somebody talked to me personally, whether that was in Sunday school teacher that spoke to me, or whether that somebody came by the house and spoke to me and shared the gospel with me. One person invested in me, saw value in me, and invited me and introduced me to that when I really heard it and God could speak to me, I responded. And it goes all the way back to one person. But see, most people, don't come, most people don't come to Jesus as an immediate response to a sermon in a crowded 
space. Most people don't do that. They come to Jesus because of the influence of an individual who took time to see value in them and invite them and invest them and introduce themselves. I mean, listen, if we, just think about it. If we thought the one person that God has laid on our heart, that one person that God has put in our lives, if we thought that one person that we were going to reach would be the next Billy Graham, would be the next Charles Stanley, Louis Giglio, Greg Laurie. I mean, if we thought our one was going to be the next one to change the world, we couldn't get there quick enough. I mean, we'd want to get there and talk to them because we want to see what God's going to do in their life because we know he's going to do something because he did something in us. We, we just wouldn't wait. But the devil's done a number on us. He doesn't want that to happen. So instead of us wondering about what God could do through our one, we sit around worried about what kind of question is our one going to ask us that we can't answer. And we stay away. And all we really have to tell someone is our story. Our way share the gospel the best we can, we may not say it right, but God always gets it right. We just got to plant the seed. We just got to let them know. So we don't need to depend on ourselves and what we know. We just need to depend on God and who he is to do what God has called us to do. Uh, here, here's something else to know about Andrew. He saw the value of insignificant gifts. Jesus is teaching on a hillside to, to 5,000 or more, 5,000 men and women, at, yeah, the women and the, and the children to it. He's, and it, the day is going kind of long. Nobody's leaving, so nobody's eight. And Philip, one of the disciples, says to Jesus, we need to send these people home so they can get something to eat. Years ago, I was in Washington, D.C. at a Promise Keepers event. There's a million men and young men. I was the young man in the million and uh, stretched from the, the Capitol to the Washington Monument back to the Lincoln Memorial. And we listened to speaker, preacher, speaker, preacher for hours. And nobody was eating. They even had to come and interrupt what was going on and tell everybody, y'all need to eat. We couldn't eat. That was just, God was moving in such a way. You just don't want it. So these people are listening to Jesus, and they're not eating. And Philip is like, hey, Jesus, we need to send them home. And Jesus says, feed them. Feed them. But Lord, <laughs> Lord, there's 5,000 people, not count the, the women and the children. There's 5,000 men out there. And, and we, 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 the easiest thing for us to do now is to, for, for you to, to pray, close this service, and send them home. So they can, that's the easiest way. That's Philip. Now, shift your attention to Andrew. And everybody, I, I, I don't know about you, but I like people like Andrew. You know, Andrew was seeing things differently. Andrew's like, if Jesus said feed them, evidently he wants to feed them. So Jesus didn't just say this just to say it. He's actually got something in mind he's going to do. So I want to see what he's going to do. I'm going to be, I want to see what's going to happen. It's like, it's like you're sitting here this morning. God just didn't send me to this church, this church body, just to sit and watch. God's doing something or about to do something, and I want to be a part of it. I don't want to just sit back and watch like Philip. I don't want to just pray and send them home. I want to see what God is going to do because I know if he said something he's going to do with this church, he's going to do I want to see what's going to happen. So Andrew goes and finds a little boy, one He's always bringing one to Jesus. And he finds this little boy and brings him to Jesus. And he says, hey, Jesus, I found this little boy. He's got five small loaves of bread and two small fish. Now, in the Greek, in the original Greek, that small fish is a sardine. So I'm going to give us a break here and say that it's brim. Uh, that's a little bit bigger than a sardine. Of course, back then, sardines might have been about the size of a drum. I don't know. But there's, there's a Greek word. But he says, but what, what will this do? I know this doesn't look like much. I mean, it's pretty insignificant in front of 5,000 plus people. But here, I know that sometimes, it, that's, I, I believe sometimes that's the reason that people uh, or, or Christians don't give. They don't give of their time. They don't give of their talents. They don't, they don't tithe. 
because it's, it's not going to be that much. What difference is this going to make? It's so insignificant. There's no way that my gift can make any kind of impact at all on anything that the church is involved in. Little is much when God's in it. Remember that. Little is much when God's in it. Insignificant gifts are used to do significant things. And God gets the glory for it. I heard this story about a young preacher. Uh, he, was, he was preaching on the feeding of the 5,000. And he was so excited because he knew how it was going to end. He had it all planned out how this was going to work and how this insignificance was going to make a big significance. And he was just, he was just flying around. And, and like me, sometimes I get, I get tongue-tied. And I, I say things wrong, and he's just preaching away. He said, let me tell you something. Jesus took 5,000 loaves of bread and 2,000 fish, and he fed five people. What about that? <laughs> and this old man sitting down in the seat says, well, great day. I could do that. <laughs> and the, the young preacher, it, it, just, it, 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 just, it flew all over him. He just, oh. So he couldn't, he couldn't even finish the message. He just prayed and sent everybody home. And he beat himself up all day. How did I mess that up? I had it all planned out. And he, all week long, he said, I got to fix this. I got to work on this. I got to get it right. I got to get it right. So the next Sunday, he shows back up at church. And he starts the sermon again, the very same one, about the five, feeding of the 5,000. He said, listen, I want to tell you something. Jesus took five loaves of bread and two fish, and he fed 5,000 people. What about that? And he looked at the old man and said, huh? And was silence. The old man said, great day, I could have done that. And he said, what? How could you possibly have done that with all the leftovers from last week? <laughs> Got you, then. I just pulled you right on in it. Anyway, have you ever wondered what is the significance of Jesus feeding all those people with one boy's lunch? The significance of it. It was to teach Andrew, his disciples, and us that no gift is insignificant in Jesus' hands. And some of us will think at times, you know, I could, I could never share my story of life change with somebody because it's, it's not that. I don't, I just, I, I'm just not good with my words. I'll, I'll mess up. They'll laugh at me. They won't listen to me. But the truth is, if we just place all of our weaknesses and our fears and our doubts in the hands of God, His power will become our strength to say what needs to be said. And He will take our insignificant abilities, our insignificant gifts, and accomplish extraordinary things. See, we're a lot like Andrew. Another thing, another thing you need to know about Andrew, he saw the value of inconspicuous service. He saw the value of inconspicuous service. He, Andrew's the picture of, of a, a believer, th those believers who labor quietly behind the scenes. Uh, they're, they're not drawing any, they don't want to draw any attention to themselves. They just want to serve others as if they're serving God. Just like it tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 6, it says, Not by the way of eye service, as people pleasers. We don't serve anybody and say, hey, hey, look, look at what all I do. Look, hey, look how faithful I am. Look how often I'm here. Look how much I give. No. But as bondservants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Andrew is more focused on God's call on his life. Doing, doing all he could to further the kingdom. Doing all he could to uh, focus on God's call on his life. To expand the reach of the gospel. One person at a time. Than it being all about him. We don't read about Andrew speaking to large crowds. We don't read about Andrew planning church after church after church after church. Andrew served with a servant's heart, mostly under the radar. It's just not, a lot of things aren't recorded about him. And I'm sure a lot of people would hear that and say, well, what point, what's the point? How can someone who's serving 
quietly? How can someone serving under the radar, how can they make an impact at all? How can they do anything? I mean, how far, how far could Andrew's inconspicuous service reach if he's in the background all the time? You got Peter, and you got James, and you got John. You got all these other disciples that people can relate to. And Paul, the, the, the apostle Paul, where's Andrew? Where's his letters in the Bible? Where's his accomplishments in the Bible? I mean, if he, why, how, could he, how far could his incomp- this inconspicuous service reach? How far could I reach quietly? I did some research, and Bible historians and theologians believe that Andrew carried the gospel, Jesus' death and resurrection, to an area we call Russia now, the Soviet Union. From Jerusalem, he traveled to what's now Russia. Some theologians and historians say he actually went as far north as Scotland, that he went to Scotland to share the gospel. There's other commentaries and theologians and uh, biblical historians who say that on his way back to Jerusalem, when he's traveling back from Scotland back to Jerusalem to go back to the church, to go back to the other disciples, to go back and be recharged or replenished or renewed, he stopped in an area of Greece. And while he was in Greece, he led a Roman leader over that province. He He led his wife to Jesus. It infuriated the Roman leader. And he demanded that she denounce her faith in Jesus. And she refused to do it. He said, all right, if you refuse to denounce it, he will never tell another soul. And he ordered Andrew crucified. After days of beatings and starvation, and he bring him to be crucified, Andrew, still being of sound mind, requested not to be crucified as Jesus was on a cross. He wasn't worthy. He wasn't significant enough. So he was crucified on a saltier. The saltier is a fancy word for an X-shaped cross. And it's believed and recorded in history that Andrew remained nailed to that cross for two days before he died. And while he was on that cross for two days, every person that passed by, he pleaded with them to repent from their sins and accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. It's also recorded in these these historical documents that his bones, after he was buried, his bones were carried back to Scotland. And they're kept at the St. Andrew's Monastery in Scotland. And another little historical fact, the flag of Scotland... It's called St. Andrew's Cross. There's another country called Nova Scotia. It has the same flag, just different colors. Nova Scotia is Latin for New Scotland. See, Andrew, Andrew is evidence of what God can do with one seemingly insignificant life that sees the significant value of one soul. I say seemingly insignificant Because the truth is, there are no insignificant lives. We never bring anyone insignificant to God. We never introduce anyone of insignificance to Jesus. As followers of Jesus, we should see the value of another person. We should see the significance of another person. We should see the significance of our one. Because we're all created in the image of God. And Jesus paid the ultimate price on a cross to redeem us and to rescue us from the sin that has its grip on us because we are significant to God. He chose us. He gave his son for us. He fills us with his spirit. He gives us his word And he sends us to the world. See, the world will never hear the gospel. The world will never hear the gospel unless God's people take the gospel to the world. Period. We've got 10 months left to reach our one this year. Today is March the 1st. Two months are gone. And many of you, I know, are working on your one today. 
You've been working on them. Why? Because they're significant. And a lot of us don't know if we're significant enough to make that difference in someone's life. But we are because we're a child of God. We're created in his image. We can make a difference in this world. Today, well, actually, tomorrow morning, Valerie Rakes, one of our own, begins a medical mission in Dominican Republic and Haiti on the border between those two countries on that one island. Along with another faculty member from Catawba and 14 other nursing students, they'll join with another medical team there and they'll serve all week long. Most people think of Haiti as insignificant. 16 people going on a mission trip may be insignificant. But I don't know if you realize that you helped fund that trip. With your generosity, what you thought was not much, is going to change the lives of people in Haiti and the Dominican Republic over the next five days. What can God do with a seemingly insignificant life if we could see the significance in another one. Let's pray. God, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for this day. I thank you for this series that we've been in. To to focus on this one person that you placed on our heart. This one individual that you placed in our mind. We can't get their name and their face out of our mind. And instead of getting upset about it and, and broken down by it, God, Ignite this fire inside and fan this fire inside that to, to, to grow. We are significant because we're your child. We can be used by you because little is much in your hands. So God, today, as we're finishing up this series and we're looking ahead and, and looking to the rest of this year, 10 months... I know that sounds like i got all, all kinds of time in the world if I've got 10 months to reach one person. But as, I, but as I, I shared with somebody this week at the gym, they said, well, you know, maybe I'll be like that thief on the cross that was at the very, while they're dying and make a decision. I said, well, when are you going to die? You never know. I know there's just 10 months left in this year. But you're one might only have a week. Why put it off? God has given you a story to share with someone else. God has given you a life to make a difference in someone's life. He's called you to make a difference in someone's life. He's called all of us because we're significant. God, today, today, remind us again who you are what you've called us to do and give us the boldness and the courage to take our little insignificant self and do something significant in us. We give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor for what you've done for us. Continue to love us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.